if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? That's a question that for most of the people in this room, you don't really have to think that hard about. In fact, for many of you, you probably had an answer to that question before I even asked the question. And some of you may even be sitting here thinking, Chris, one thing, I have a laundry list of changes I would like to make in my life. The desire to change in your life is not unique to you. Uh, in just a little over a month, we're going to start the month of January and kick off a new year. And in January, Americans will spend roughly $60 billion on weight loss programs, gym memberships, self-help books, and organizational and motivational apps. And people are going to make all of these changes and do all of these things, but within about two months... 80% of all of these changes people try to make will fail. And people will go back to the same way they were living before. And the same thing is true in our faith. Many people in the coming months are going to make big plans for spiritual growth and spiritual change in their life. And so churches will see a rise in attendance. People are going to commit to growth. They're going to buy devotionals that they'll read throughout the year. They're going to plan to remove sin in their life, plan to grow in their relationship with God. But like the physical changes, most of these plans for change will fall flat. We're obsessed with change, but real transformation seems forever out of reach. We are wrapping up our series, Dangerous Prayers, this morning. And what we've been doing is taking a few weeks to study prayers that if prayed in the right way with the right heart can radically transform our lives and take us to places we never expected God would take us. And today we're gonna to wrap up by talking about this prayer, change me. For many of you, change seems like an impossible task, like an unreachable goal for you. And so maybe earlier when I was talking about these unmet goals, maybe you were reminded of different ways that you had planned to change and felt like you failed in that. Things that you had worked towards, things that you had prayed for. And I'm not talking about surface level things like weight loss changes or trying to develop organizational skills. Maybe you had these big plans in your life for spiritual change that you thought never happened. The patience that you tried to develop and never really felt like you got there the forgiveness that you struggled to give, the sins that you tried to cut out of your life and failed to do so. We've all felt the gap between who we want to be and who we are. Change is something we desperately desire, but so often feel that it's unreachable for us. But what if I told you that that perception was far off from the reality that scripture teaches us, that scripture actually tells us that change is happening in this very moment, that we are being discipled, whether we realize it in one of two directions, either towards God or away from God. And so the question this morning isn't, can I change? Because the reality is that change is inevitable. The question this morning is who are you becoming? So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can open those up to Romans 12 today. And what I want us to do is talk about this prayer, change me, because change me doesn't become a dangerous prayer when we ask God to change us into who we want to be. But I believe that change me becomes a dangerous prayer when we pray that God would change us into who he wants us to be, and then we choose to live that out. And living out this prayer is going to require us to make some critical decisions in our life this morning as we work to live that out. But I believe if we can do that, that we'll watch God do some amazing things in our life. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, open those up to Romans 12, and we're going to look at the first couple of verses this morning. Uh, if you're not familiar with the book of Romans, it is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And to me, I don't really know that there's a better book to study about change than Romans because Paul is kind of like the poster child for change. He underwent a radical change in his own life. He went from being Paul, the person who killed Christians, the Pharisee, to Paul, the most prominent missionary in church history. That's no small change. And so Paul writes this book really talking about the change that we find in Jesus and how we respond to that this morning. 
And so much of Paul's content revolves around this central theme of our need for a savior and how we then in turn respond to the grace and mercy extended to us by God. And as we get to chapter 12, Paul is gonna open with a call to change. And so if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, look at verses one and two with me this morning. Uh, I'm gonna be reading from the ESV or the English Standard Version. We're typically uh, reading the NIV, but there's a little bit better translation of some of the verbs in here. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The biggest barrier to change is thinking that it's impossible. But Paul understood that change is not only inevitable, but that changing to become more and more like God is a far more realistic goal than we actually believe it is. Now, Paul's going to start this passage with a word, he says, or with this phrase, by the mercies of God, but he starts that phrase with the word, therefore. And anytime you see the word, therefore, in scripture, you need to understand it's there for a reason. So Paul's going to give us this phrase, by the mercies of God, and he's going to kick that off with the Greek word dia. And dia means through or by the instrumentality of. So we're in Romans 12, and you have 11 chapters before this. And in these 11 chapters, Paul spends much of this time talking about our desperate need for for a Savior, that we are sinners in need of mercy and in need of grace, and we have to respond to that. But Paul, in these 11 chapters, also gives us a beautiful truth, that we need a Savior, and we have a Savior. And so Paul says that we are saved by the mercies and the grace of God. And so the change that we desperately seek does not come because we try harder, but by making the decision to follow Jesus. And it is through the mercy and grace that we experience from God that we then change. He says it this way in Romans 6, 1 through 7. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. For those who, we are those who have died to have sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So on our own, we are incapable of change. Paul calls a life of G- without Jesus a body ruled by sin. And so if you haven't experienced the power of grace, change is not possible that you will consistently fall to sin no matter how hard you try. And so there's no self-help book, no strategy in the world that will allow you to overcome sin if you do not follow Jesus because by definition, you are a slave to it and it rules over your life. But Jesus changes everything. When we follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, putting our faith in him and turning away from our, our sins and following him in obedience, right? it says that our old self, this flesh that was ruled by sin, is now dead in Christ. And in the same way that we die with him in his crucifixion, it says that we then raise in his resurrection, that we are a new creation in Christ. And so what this means is that you are a new creation that's been set free from the power of sin. Now, if you're a follower of Christ, this should be an incredible encouragement to you because what this means is that by the mercies of God, you're called to be a living sacrifice is what Paul says in verse one. And because of what Jesus did, you can do that, that you are a new creation set free from sin. And so by the mercies and the grace of God, you have the ability to live in obedience to God and change to look more like Jesus, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did for you through his death and his resurrection. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, I want you to understand that this change that you desperately seek in your life starts here. It's not about trying to do more. It's not about trying to work harder. 
It's about making a critical decision to follow Jesus. That the change you seek is found only through the grace in Jesus. And I want you to know that the decision to follow Jesus will change everything for you because he will make you into a new creation that is free from sin. And I want you to understand this kind of life change that's possible through Jesus. Jesus doesn't just make you into a better person. He makes you a new person, that you are a new creation. The old is dead, the new has come. And so where you were once ruled by sin, where you once felt this, this impossible change in your life that you could not become better, Jesus now makes that possible because you are a new creation through his resurrection. That he loved you so much that he came to earth, lived a perfect life in your place, died on a cross as a sacrifice for your sins. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin was death. He paid that. And through his resurrection, he defeated sin and death forever, allowing you to live a life of freedom in Christ because you are a new creation. So if you're here today and you don't follow Jesus, I'd love to talk to you about that. I will tell you that this is not only the best decision you can make in your life, but it's the most critical decision that you can make in your life. That if you want real change in your life, it starts with a relationship with Jesus. And so if you want to talk about what it looks like to follow him, look, after the sermon, I'll be in the back of the room for invitation. I would love to be able to talk to you about that and help you with this process. Change starts with a decision of who we follow. And so Paul says we can either be pulled further into a life of sin or we can be set free by following Jesus. And so it comes down to the critical decision of who we will follow. Change is inevitable. The question is, will you be a slave to sin or free in Christ? I look back with me at verses one and two. We'll read it again. It says that I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So Paul begins with his appeal of the gospel, and then he's going to move into how we respond to Jesus. And he's going to sum it up really simply. He says that we are to be a living sacrifice to God. Now, it's a simple command but it really holds a lot of significant weight when you break it down. So Paul is referring to the Old Testament concept of making sacrifices to God. And if you wanna know something about Old Testament sacrifices, they had a really, really big requirement that had to be met. They had to be spotless and without blemish. And so what that means is that the standard for sacrifices were that sacrifices had to be perfect. And that is the same standard that we are to strive for. Now, here's the good news, is that the requirement for perfection has been met by Jesus, that God, when he looks at us, if you are a follower of Christ, he sees Jesus' perfection instead of your sin. And so the requirement for perfection has been met. But we are called to imitate Christ in his perfection. And Paul talks about this using a qualifier for what this sacrifice is supposed to be. He says that we are to be a holy sacrifice, pleasing and acceptable to God. Now, the word holy there is the Greek word hagias. And hagias means literally to be different, set apart, and distinguished. You know, when I was a football coach, we would work tirelessly in the off season to recruit players. Now we were private school. You weren't technically supposed to do that, but everyone does. I don't listen to them. So we would actually meet with parents and players and have meals with them, get to know them. We, of course, would get game film. We'd study them. And as a coach, you could usually tell if a player was going to be good at football because you had game film. So you'd watch them. You get to see their games. You'd study them, understand them. And that was how it usually went. But Every once in a while, anybody that knows sports knows that there are just some people that from the minute you meet them, you know they have that it factor. I remember one time in particular, uh, our head coach and I were meeting with a mother of a 13-year-old offensive lineman. And this kid, he was a good kid. He had good grades. But more importantly, he was six foot four, 360 pounds as an eighth grader. And so he's one of those kids that, that you're just blown away the minute you meet him. I remember my first thought when I saw him for the first time was, oh my gosh, if they let him play junior varsity, he will kill someone. When you see people like that, it's a different caliber. You know from the minute you meet them, something is different about them. Paul says that's how we're supposed to look to the rest of the world that the way we live 
should set us apart and distinguish us completely from the people around us, that we are to be a holy people, pleasing and acceptable to God. And so what this practically looks like in our lives really is the removal of sin in our lives. Because the reality is you cannot be holy and actively living in sin. You can't be caught up in living like the world and hoping that you'll change to look more like Jesus. It doesn't work that way because you're either living in a way that pushes you towards Christ or in a way that pushes you away from Christ. And so you gotta hear me out a little bit this morning. You cannot be holy and addicted to pornography. You cannot be holy and having sex before marriage. You cannot be holy and consumed with pride. You cannot be holy and getting drunk on the weekends. And I'm not saying that you have to live your life perfectly, but the point that Paul is making here is that if there is any sin that is rampant in your life, that is not holiness. And it therefore has to be removed in pursuit of obedience. And this isn't a one-time act. Paul refers to holiness as being a living sacrifice. And that's a little different because a dead sacrifice is dead. That's a one-time deal. But a living sacrifice is a sacrifice until the end of its life. And so for us, we need to understand that being holy is not a one-time decision, but it is a constant effort to live in the obedience of Jesus Christ and move closer to look like him. It is the daily decision to sacrifice. Jesus said it this way himself in Luke 9, 23 through 24. He then said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. So if you want God to change you into the kind of person he wants you to be, it means making the critical decision to die to yourself. It means that you die to your preferences, you die to your ideals, you die to your thoughts, your actions, your speech. Everything is to be nailed to the cross as you follow Jesus in obedience. Crucifixion is something that's always interested me, not only because, of course, crucifixion is what allows us to be saved by Jesus, but the act of crucifying itself was a bit of a spectacle. If you were somebody that was being crucified, one of the main things that would happen to you, if it was a bad enough crime, uh, you would be placed on your crossbar and you would then carry your crossbar to your place of crucifixion. And so what would actually happen is specifically like in cities like Jerusalem, you would actually have people line the streets and they would watch you the entire time as you walked to your death. And so if you're being crucified, there's no mistaking that you're carrying your cross. So you gotta ask yourself this morning, do people see you carrying yours? Do your actions, the way you speak, the way you live, can people see something different about you? Do they see you carrying your cross every single day? If not, you have a critical decision that you have to make. That you have to make the conscious decision and effort to live sacrificially. I think so often we think that change just kind of magically happens. Like we get this idea that God's kind of like this genie that we wish for change and then he just goes like, whoop, okay, you're good. But we neglect the fact that because of the mercy and grace of God, because of the actions of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, that we've already been changed. And we are now called to live differently because of the way that we've been changed. And so our goal in life is not that we pray harder to change. The goal is that we have to make a or decision to live differently. Being changed by God is not about praying some special prayer. It's about making the choice to live in obedience because of the change that God has already made possible through your life. The work that he's already begun in you, you now live it out. And so Jesus' call, a call to take up your cross daily, it's a massive call. But that massive call is answered in obedience 
through the everyday choices. That being a living sacrifice means that every single day you make the decision to repent to turn away from your sin and live in obedience. It means that every day you make the decision to submit to God no matter what happens, that you submit to his word even if you don't agree with it or feel like you should agree with it. It means that we make a choice every single day to think about the way that we live and the way that we act. It means that we choose our friendships and relationships carefully. It means that we love our enemies. Being a living sacrifice means that we prioritize Jesus above everything else in our life, that he is the one that defines every aspect of our life. And it means that we do not get to take a break from this. That being a living sacrifice means that every single day we make the decision to die in our entirety for the sake of following Jesus. And listen, I know that sounds like a lot. It is a lot. Because Jesus isn't asking for some of you. He's asking for all of you. That the call in response to the grace of Jesus is that we would commit in our entirety to Jesus. That if we are to be a living sacrifice, every part of us is to be consumed entirely on the cross. And so change is possible not because we pray a prayer. It's possible first by the sacrifice of Jesus. And then we live out this change in obedience. Sounds like a lot, and it is. But the end result of our sacrifice is worth every bit of the effort that we put into it. Because in our death, we find life in Christ. That the change we desperately desire is found in our sacrifice and obedience to Jesus. And so this morning, we must make the decision to sacrifice. And if we will do that, you will watch God change your life in radical ways that you didn't even know were possible. All right, look back at verse two with me. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So Paul's going to double down in verse two about the awareness that we need to have about change. And Paul makes sure that you know it here. So he uses two different verbs here. He says, do not be Conformed, do not be transformed. And this is why specifically we're using the ESV this morning is in the Greek, these were passive verbs. And so what a passive verb means is there's an implication of external forces being applied. And so that means that whether you want it to or not, whether you realize it or not, you are being changed in this very moment. There are external forces that are pushing and pulling you in different directions. And so Paul says one of two things happened. Either we are being conformed to the world are we being transformed by God? And I think one of the biggest dangers that we have in faith is that we think there's some kind of middle ground here, that we buy into this lie that there's some sort of like half Christian compromise that we can be all in for Jesus and still like somewhat in for the world. Does that make sense? And I think we struggle with this concept and not understanding that there is no gray area in change. The harsh reality is either we are moving towards Jesus or we're moving away from Jesus. And I think this is something that all of us really struggle with even when we don't realize it. And I'm not even just talking about obedience here because Paul says that if you really wanna know where the war for change is won, if you wanna understand where this battle and this struggle really comes from, He says it happens more in the mind, that your mind is either conformed to the world or transformed by God. And so the goal ultimately is that we would let our mind be influenced and filled with godly things so that we are then transformed by the renewing of our mind. But so often, we're not really good at filling our mind with godly things. And think about your daily life in general. Think about all the things that your life is filled with, that our minds, more often than not, if we're not careful, are influenced by the things that come from the world. And so we're influenced daily by things like work, TV, social media, video games, books, all these different things. And the problem with that is, is that we've got all this time that all this stuff is taking up, and then we're like, and here's this little bit for God. 
And the problem with this is, is that if what our mind is filled with and what we are mostly influenced by is the world, it shouldn't really come as a shock to us when we look and act like the world. And so Paul says, no, you have to fill your mind with the things of Christ so that your mind is transformed and renewed daily. Now, what I'm not telling you is that you need to go into your phone and like delete all of your secular music. I'm not telling you, you got to cut off Netflix and all these different things. I'm not even telling you that you need to throw out your video games or delete your mobile apps because I know that some of you probably still play Candy Crush. It's been years, guys. So you can delete the app. It's okay. Uh, but what I am telling you is that if you want your mind to be renewed by transformation, like if you want God to change you, you're going to have to prioritize filling it with godly things, that he has to take the priority even in the things that we allow us to influence. And again, I'm not just talking about the things that we then are obedient to, but even the things we allow to have any kind of influence or take up time in our life. And so this is why I believe it's important to do things like be consistent with coming to church. If you want to talk about something that fills your time, think about what being here on Sunday mornings does, that you're in a group of believers, you're together in community, you're studying God's word, and you're worshiping God. Do you understand what that does for your mind? that you're in a group of people that as we gather on Sunday mornings, we are being encouraged and challenged to grow and deepen our faith. That's a big deal. It's also why studying your Bible and your personal time is important that we're consistent in reading the word of God because scripture tells us that the word of God is alive and active and that when we study it and apply it, it deeply impacts our life. I'd also encourage you to start listening to more worship music. You don't have to just listen to it on Sunday morning, guys. They record this stuff. It's wonderful. And, and so what I'm telling you, again, is that you don't need, I'm not saying you need to go in and like delete every playlist you have and change every song and like throw in a worship music, like song into your workout playlist. If you do that, that's wonderful. But what I will tell you is that if you'll start implementing worship music into your daily life, maybe it's something as simple as on your way to and from work. Or maybe it's when you first wake up in the morning, you start listening to worship music. You'll find that if you'll do these things, they put your focus back on God. And when our focus is on God and our mind is being filled with the things of God in these moments, there is renewal. And in the renewal, there's transformation. And so if you want to live more like Christ, right? If we seek this change, it will come when we fill and influence our minds with the things of Christ. So allow the things of Christ to influence you and let God transform you through that. Now, renewing our minds isn't just about what we fill our minds with. It's also about submitting to God, even when pressured by the world, to conform our beliefs and lifestyles to its beliefs and lifestyles. Because the world's going to try and pull you back into it. Remember, he says, don't be conformed. That means the world is constantly trying to pull you back into it. And what I will tell you is that Satan will use every tactic he can in order to make that happen. If you think that Satan doesn't know how to twist and lie his way into tricking you out of your commitments and convictions, you are wrong. Satan is crafty. He is called the deceiver for a reason. And so he is good at convincing us with fine sounding arguments. Think about Adam and Eve. Why did Eve eat the fruit? She was convinced. You don't think the enemy uses the same tactics today? Think about how often we are told that we have to change the way we live and the way we believe because it's outdated, it's bigoted, it's time to change. The world is constantly trying to conform you to its beliefs and its convictions. And you hear it all the time. We're told that we need to change our views on the sanctity of marriage. Why? Because they say God is loving. If God is loving, God must be accepting. We're told that we need to ease up on things like sex before marriage. Why? Because everybody does it. It's not a big deal anymore. We're told that we don't really need to be like super Christians. You don't need to be religious. All right, don't be committed to God. That's ridiculous. God wants a casual relationship with you because the only thing he's interested in is that he loves you. Some of these things are well-crafted and they can sound good, Sometimes they're even well-intentioned, but they're not truth. The fact of the matter is that truth is not subjective. The word of God is truth. And we are called to submit to that truth, whether we agree with it, whether we feel like it, whether we think the world's going to love the way that we respond to it. That's not up to us. What is up to us is to submit to God 
and what he says. And we live that out. And so if you want your mind to be transformed, not conformed, it's not about trying to find some pleasing balance between what the world believes and what God says. We submit fully to what God says. And so it means that we study his word. It means that we know what the truth of his word is. We apply it to our lives. And even in the moments where we don't agree or we don't like it, we submit because he's God. And when we submit, there is transformation in that. So don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. Do not let Satan trick you into thinking that there is a half commitment. Do not let Satan trick you into giving up your beliefs and convictions because he makes things sound good. Stand firm in the truth of God's word. Let it convict you and submit to it and live in obedience to it. And so if we're filling our minds with the things of God and submitting to his truth, we will find change as God continues to renew our mind and transforms us to look more and more like Jesus every single day. All right, look back with me one last time at verse two. We'll look at the back half of this. He says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So becoming more like Jesus is a long, continual process. Some days, to be honest with you, you're going to do really well. I mean, you're going to kill it. Other days, you're going to fail miserably. But you need to understand that's okay and understand that the goal is that you get back up and you keep going. What I love about the end of this verse is that it's a great encouragement from Paul that there is a hope as we pursue change, that the more consistent you are in trying to live like Jesus, the better you get at it. That not only do you grow in obedience as we're consistent in that, but Paul says that we actually grow in discernment and wisdom. And what he means by that is the more that we try, the more that we try and live this out, it doesn't mean we'll always get it bright, but that we're consistent day by day, that we actually learn what it looks like to live in a pleasing and acceptable way to God. And so what he means by that is that we get better at it every single day, even in the mistakes, that we grow to look more and more like Jesus. And so what that means for you is that in the moments where you get things right, that's great. Keep going. Even in the moments where you fail, don't stop. Don't give up. Don't slip back into the patterns of the world because you mess up. Get back on your feet, push towards Christ, and pursue holiness. Live in the grace and the mercies that God has provided for you that change is already made possible because you have already been changed. The goal is now you live that out. So make the decision to pursue holiness and live it out every single day of your life and watch as God radically transforms your life. In 1934, there was a man by the name of Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson that year gave his life to Christ and he was also an alcoholic and he made the mo a decision the moment that he decided to follow Jesus, he also made the decision to pursue sobriety. So he gives up alcohol and he's excited. When he does this, he knows in that moment he's already experienced the transformative power of grace. He knows he's been changed. And so he thinks, man, like giving up alcohol, like this is gonna be easy. He's like, it's a breeze. Except six months into his sobriety, he found himself in Akron, Ohio, standing outside of the Mayflower Hotel. He had a bad business deal, was feeling defeated. He knew the hotel had a bar in it. And all of a sudden he found himself with this overwhelming desire to break his sobriety and get drunk. And so he walks into this hotel, he's standing there in the hallway, he's right outside the bar, and he, he knows he has a decision to make. And so he thinks about it, he thinks about it, and suddenly he has this realization. He realized that God had already changed him. He knew he was not the same person he was before. He was not this man whose life was consumed with alcohol. God had already changed that. But he knew that that change wasn't gonna help him if he didn't live it out. 
And so in the moment, in desperation, he leaves. He doesn't walk into the bar. He walks back outside. He finds the first phone booth he can. He starts calling churches. And he's just trying to find another recovering alcoholic that he can talk to to talk him down in this moment. So he calls a bunch of churches. And at first, no one is able to help him. But one of the people that he manages to get a hold of refers him to a man by the name of Bob Smith. And he gets a hold of Bob Smith. They talk on the phone. Bob Smith helps him remain sober in that moment. And what's cool is those men would go on to become friends and they would actually go on to start a little organization that you may know by the name of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill passed away 37 years later in 1971. And in those 37 years when he died, at that point there were over 100,000 AA groups that existed worldwide. And today, millions of people have had their lives changed because of the program that he helped start. Bill spent his entire life helping alcoholics understand that real change wasn't just about one moment, but it was about living out that change every single day to make the decision to live in obedience. Alcoholics Anonymous has a famous philosophy. It's one day at a time. And that came from Bill's experience that he had the realization that living out the change from God was not about that one moment, but about making the decision daily to live in obedience. Some of you may find yourself in a similar hallway moment today. You know you've been changed by God, but you feel this struggle, this battle back and forth between your old life and your new life. And sometimes that battle feels like something you're not gonna win feels like something that's impossible. You feel like change isn't possible. But can I tell you that you have the greatest hope through change in Jesus. If you are a follower of Christ, that change has already happened. You are a new creation because of the grace and the mercies of God. Now the call is that you would just live out that change. Some days you're gonna do really well. You're gonna fight the good fight. You'll live in obedience. Other days, that old life's gonna fight back hard. It's gonna feel like a struggle. And some days, it may win the battle. Don't let it win the war. In the moments of our failure, we get back up, we pursue Christ, we keep going. We choose to live in obedience because we understand that real change isn't about a one-time decision, but that it's about a daily decision to live out the change that God has already made possible. Change is inevitable. And so the question is, who are you becoming? Will you live a life that continues to conform you to the patterns of the world? Or will you live out this dangerous prayer of change me? Make the choice daily to live in obedience to God and let him transform you into the person that he's called you to be. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. You have made the impossible possible, that you took sinful, messed up people. You have made us clean and righteous through the death and resurrection of your son. You have changed us and we are called to live out that change. God, help us to know that real change is not about just making a decision in the moment, but it's about choosing every single day to die to ourselves and pursue you. We're not always gonna get it right, but Father, we live in that grace and that mercy that you've already extended us and we continue to push towards you as you continue to change us to look more and more like you. Help us to boldly live that out, to live out the change that you have made possible for us. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.